right, folks, um, this is going to be a bit of a recap on my, my treadmill experience. So I'll give you kind of some details of kind of like the hows, the whys, and kind of how the day played out, and uh, give you a little bit of insight into kind of that whole, that whole event together. Um, essentially, what ended up happening, if you weren't following some of my stuff leading into this, was at some point in, I believe it was March, when all the races kind of started getting canceled, it became pretty clear that we weren't going to see any organized endurance events happening probably for at least the first half of the year. So I had been a good bit into a training cycle for a hundred miler over in London that was going to be on a track. So like a real flat, fast environment. And I had just finished doing a couple of 140 mile weeks with about a hundred miles each in there uh, specifically at like goal hundred mile pace. So I was kind of well into that, like real race intensity, distance specific phase of training. And I was about to enter a deload week, which I'll take every once in a while during those big buildups to kind of just let my body reset before, you know, hitting another big cycle of training. And it like, as I was going to that deload week was when the races all started to kind of cascade and, uh, and cancel. So, uh, I wanted to try to make the right decision based on where I was at. And uh, I guess there's basically kind of two directions in my opinion to go. And one was just scale back on kind of the peaking phase, except that you put in some good training, but it's going to have to pay forward down the road, like maybe the second half of the year, even further down the road, which in my opinion, isn't a bad decision. I think like when you see people have a performance or a race it can be really interesting to see like, well, what did they do for like the six to eight weeks leading up to that event? Like where was their training at? What were they doing? And I think there's a lot of value in looking at that, but I also think it has to be acknowledged that oftentimes when you see someone have a really good race, it's more of a culmination of years of work piling up, years of experience piling up versus any one six to eight week training block. So it wouldn't have been a total loss just to kind of like scale back and do nothing and just generally focus on fitness. Uh, but I was uh, like interested in doing something or having an endpoint to that training cycle in some way, other than just cutting it, cutting it all together. And, you know, I was familiar with like treadmill records and treadmill run stuff within the ultra running community from guys like Jacob Puzzi, um, guys like Dave Proctor, Michael Wardian, uh, Mario Mendoza, who've all gone after things like 50 Ks, 50 miles, 100 mile, 12 hour type stuff in the past. So uh, I've always been kind of interested in it, but just never really, I guess, found a place to put it given a normal context of basically the availability of races year round. So I hadn't really gotten around to really structure anything for it. Uh, so my thought was since I've been focusing on specifying for a flat 400 meter track, it's not from, at least from a mechanical standpoint, uh, it's not too far from a treadmill, at least relative to other types of surfaces you can train on. So I thought that would maybe slide in fairly nicely, even with a limited time window. Uh, so I sat down with Nicole, my wife, and was just chatting about like, well, you know, I wonder if this would be something fun to do. And, you know, we talked about just, you know, putting up a live stream. So it was documented and hopping on the treadmill I'd had and just go from there. And, you know, once I pitched the idea to some of my sponsors and uh, a contact I have at NordaTrack, uh, they they thought it was a pretty cool idea. So they kind of all got excited and got around and kind of developed into more of an event versus just me being on a, a treadmill and boring everyone to death for 12 hours. And uh, ultimately what we ended up doing is uh, planning a setup where it was going to be like a 12 to 13 hours worth of video stream. I would be on the treadmill, but we'd also be bringing in guest hosts, guest speakers to kind of give updates, share their stories, share their experiences, comment on kind of how I was looking and feeling and kind of put together a bit of like full day entertainment for anyone who wanted to come in and check out some of some of those guest speakers rather than just, you know, what I'm doing, but also maybe passively pay attention to where I was at. Uh, and, you know, it ended up being a, kind of a pretty cool setup in my opinion it's really fortunate to have some really great people come in. Uh, and if you're curious about that list, uh, you can check it out on my Instagram page. I've got the list of all the folks there and the times they came in during the day, as well as if you just want to check out the, the YouTube videos on this channel, if you want to see any of those right now, they're broken into two big videos of just over six hours each. 
So what I'll end up doing over the course of the next few weeks is cutting that down into smaller videos. So if you're interested in just hearing what one of my guests has to say, then uh, you can just get and go to straight, straight to that video. So like if you decide like, oh, I want to I wanna hear what Courtney DeWalter's up to. Well, you can just go look at the clip that Courtney DeWalter's in. And that'll be kind of available in the, in the coming weeks too for anyone who's interested in checking that stuff out. Um, but in terms of the, the run itself or the event itself from the treadmill side of things, uh, I'll share a little bit of a blow by blow of kind of how things went through the day. Uh, I went into it basically the same way as I do any kind of ultra marathon where I try to specify in the environment and the intensity at which I'm going to race. So what this meant is I just started skewing a lot of my long runs and some of my weekly miles onto the treadmill. Uh, from the timeline standpoint and just like a real perfect buildup for something like a treadmill, I was probably lacking a little bit in the amount of that I would normally like to do. Uh, but I was, you know, I'm also not necessarily going to be, focusing primarily on treadmill stuff going forward either. So, you know, there was a little bit of sanity to be kept, I think, in terms of, you know, not spending every mile of every week building up being on the treadmill and still getting outside for some of the runs. But, uh, you know, I had a couple a couple back-to-back -back long run weekends where I'd get on the treadmill for like 40, 40-ish miles. I think my biggest one was a 43-mile weekend where I did a 22-miler and a 21-miler on the treadmill and basically my goal with that was just to try to figure out the mechanics of all of it, try to identify where are going to be some spots that I can count on being different and, and maybe respond to before day of and try to really understand what it's going to feel like being on a treadmill versus some of the other environments I've raced in in the past. And, you know, one of the things I kind of identified was physically, I didn't think it was going to be a huge issue. I didn't think there was going to be any weird, like, set any, any type of weird like aches and pains that I wouldn't normally experience. In fact, running straight on a treadmill might be a little kinder than making all the turns on like a 400 meter track. Uh, but what I realized I think was like just having the treadmill essentially tell you what to do by setting a pace and then responding to the belt is a little different of like kind of a psychological thing, a little bit of a different mental approach than kind of determining your pace on your own efforts. So this can be good in the sense that I don't have to burn a bunch of mental energy thinking about, okay, I want to run this pace. I can just set the treadmill to it. The negative of that is you kind of get this weird mindset or this weird like psychological behavior, or at least I did, where you kind of feel like you're being told what to do versus deciding what to do. So it made it like really hard to kind of stay on the treadmill for long periods of time. And I think that was one of the the biggest differences on this event versus some of the other stuff I've done was that kind of nagging at your mind of like, Oh, I'm still on this thing and it's telling me what to do and I'm not in control. Kind of a, kind of a thought process. Um, but you know, I, I semi was able to kind of navigate that by just switching treadmills or getting off occasionally for a bathroom break and kind of breaking it up like that. And I can get into a little more details of that as we go. Uh, in terms of how the day went overall, I think, I would identify two kind of mistakes I made that probably cost me some time uh, that if I were to do this again, I would, I would try to account for. And the first one was hydration. I like really underestimated how much fluids I was going to need for this effort. It, uh, you know, I was basing some of it off of my experience at the Pettit Center last August, where I ran the 100 mile and 12 hour world records there. And that environment was pretty ideal from a temperature standpoint. They, it's a speed skating rink, an Olympic training facility, so they keep it pretty cool at around 60 degrees. And I thought I could mimic that in the house by turning the thermostat down, getting fans in the room, getting an air conditioner in the room, and bringing the temp down close to that. And in reality, it just wasn't able to. Like, we couldn't get the therm I mean, I live in Phoenix, so maybe this was stupid to think of in the, the beginning. I probably got close to 100 degrees that day. So it was really hard to get the house to bring the thermostat down, down below like 70, even 75 degrees. And then in the room itself, it was probably a little cooler. But one thing that was mentioned to me afterwards I thought was interesting is that it's hard to know exactly how warm it is where you're at on the treadmill because you're kind of isolated. You're in one spot. So your body heat is kind of like, you're just kind of wallowing in your own body heat. You're not running away from it like you would even on a 400 meter track. And there's also heat coming off the machine that's kind of just radiating up at you. So it might be warmer in this like little bubble around the treadmill than it even is in the house. And, you know, long story short, 
the first couple hours, I just wasn't drinking enough. And I started to notice that, that, that my stomach was kind of getting a little tight. And given that this was at my house, I knew it wasn't something I ate the days before because I was literally eating what I eat all the time. So that was one of the advantages of this type of event. You can really control that. You don't have to worry about going out to a restaurant in some different country or in a state you don't live in and, and having to risk eating food that someone else cooked and you didn't see and stuff like that. But, um, so I was next to positive. It wasn't something like that. My routine was pretty dialed in there and I was pretty sure it wasn't like the fueling I had been doing to that point because it was just way too early. Like an hour, two hours in is, is not when you're going to have this stomach distress from fueling. It's just way, unless you're trying to take in an absurd amount of calories, which I wasn't, I was targeting around 40 grams an hour in the early stages. And, uh, you know, so I was pretty sure it was dehydration. So that caused me to have to run to the bathroom a few times. And once I realized that I kind of rallied a bit and just told Nicole, I was like, okay, I need to really get on top of water and electrolytes now. And I think like the next couple hours I was hitting close to 60 ounces of water and one hour I had four electrolyte tabs that just like, you know, I was playing catch up, which I guess is a little risky probably because you have to be careful with what your body is able to process. And, you know, fortunately that worked out okay for me. I caught back up and I could even tell probably around four ish hours in that, like I was feeling like I had kind of a little bit of a weight off my shoulders, my stomach loosened up again and, you know, I felt really smooth. So uh, it probably costed me a little bit there, but, uh, it was also something I think could have gone much worse had I not recognized that and, and kind of gotten on top of it. And the second thing that I didn't anticipate that I find really interesting is we had so much power running through that corner of the house where I had the treadmill between the two machines, the portable air conditioner, turning the thermostat down and all the video stuff that, uh, we were having a little bit of power shortage coming to the treadmill screen. So the treadmill screen would pause every once in a while when it, the surges would be a little too high. And what that would mean is the belt would keep moving, but the screen would pause. So it would be like, I'll give you an example. The first time it happened is at 2.8 miles. So the screen stopped reporting distance, stopped reporting time. So it just sat at 19 minutes, 27 seconds and 2.8 miles for about three minutes before I noticed it. And once I noticed it, you know, luckily I had two treadmills there. So I just hopped on the other one and we took inventory of where I, my last documented spot was, which was the 2.8, um, miles. And then just started, uh, you know, accumulating more time and distance on the treadmill that screen was screen was getting the power to. And, you know, so that probably cost me about three minutes of running at, I think I was running at about a nine mile per hour pace during that phase, uh, that I kind of lost in there. But once we recognized that that was what was happening, we would catch it pretty easily. I was like watching that screen like a hawk to make sure it didn't happen again or when it happened again, I'd switch. And at this point, we didn't know what was causing it. So my only real move at that point in time was whenever the screen freezes, jump to the other treadmill as quickly as you can and waste as little time as possible and try not to like overthink it or stress out about it because it's not something you can really do anything out about other than uh, brainstorm a little bit and hopefully figure out what's going on. Uh, you know, after a while we kind of started thinking maybe this is a power issue. So what we did is we took a, a really long extension cord and ran the treadmills out into its, the, the other side of the house. And then it worked with perfect the rest of the day. I, I think I spent about 20 miles on two occasions on the treadmill closer to the wall. If you see on the background here, uh, which is the treadmill I started kind of preferring after a while, partly because if you if you could see inside this room, there's a door facing that first treadmill or that treadmill closest to the wall. So I could see out into the what is our like our dining room kitchen area. So I could see like Nicole out there. I could see Stella, our dog out there. And it was just like more things to look at, I guess. So and you're on a treadmill, you're looking for any little thing to kind of distract you or to entertain you outside of staring at a blank wall, which is kind of what I was doing on the other treadmill that you see on the picture behind me. Um, so that's the other thing that was kind of created a hurdle or a challenge to get over. Uh, but other than that, um, the other thing I found kind of interesting about the day was my fueling in general relative to the Pettit Center race in August. Uh, just from experience and my own individual needs, I'm pretty confident that kind of 40 grams of carbohydrate an hour is kind of a sweet spot for me for a race like this. For something that's about 12 hours a race where I'm going to maybe be up in about 150 beats per minute or so that 40 grams an hour seems to be just enough 
to make that feel sustainable and get a little bit of that performance boost from carbohydrate, but not so much that I'm going to run into digestive issues along the way from over consuming too much carbohydrate or feel like I need to be pounding tons of carbohydrate in my day to day life in order to quote unquote train my gut to be able to tolerate it. I don't feel like I get limited in the intensity I need by going as low as 40 grams an hour. And I don't feel like I eclipse my digestive capabilities, even following a high fat, low carb diet on my day to day stuff. So um, that's just my own experience that I've identified over the course of years of kind of more or less trial and error and focusing on where my performances are at and workouts and races and things like that. And on this particular day, because of that kind of bout of fluid loss in the early stages that uh, gave me a bit of a hurdle to get over. I was, I'd scaled way back on how much calories I was taking in. Uh, partly just because like if your stomach is feeling a little upset, it can be kind of a kiss of death to try to pound a bunch of calories down at the same time. And so I kind of just leaned on like the fact that I'm prob I'm burning higher rates of fat than the average high carb athlete or moderate carbohydrate athlete and scaled back a little bit just to avoid having to hop off the treadmill and use the bathroom in case that would become an issue. And basically what that ended up resulting in is over the course of the day, I probably averaged closer to maybe 20 grams of carbohydrate per hour versus the 40 I would normally target. The interesting thing I find about that is when I was, since I had access to all this data while I was on the treadmill, I could watch my heart rate the whole time. And the biggest difference I noticed between this event and the Pettit Center from that standpoint was at the Pettit Center, when I was able to do about 40 grams an hour, I would felt pretty comfortable flexing up into 150 in terms of it being sustainable throughout the course of that day. Whereas on the treadmill, I felt kind of like if I got much up above 145 for too long. It started to feel like it was a little bit more unsustainable. So I was kind of floating closer to like the 140 to 145 range versus like 145, maybe the 150 range. Um, and, you know, who knows if that's just like that extra 20 grams of carbohydrates, what I, what I need personally to kind of get myself up into that peak performance phase. I like to think so, but you know, it's, it's ultra marathoning. So you never really know for sure. Cause there's a lot of kind of unknowns and there's a lot of kind of cloudiness when it comes to trying to tease some of the stuff out when there's so many confounding variables, even in a controlled environment like this, where, uh, you know, I'm on a one machine, I'm on, I guess, two machines, but a very consistent environment. Uh, there's still some some differences in uh, something like this versus the track at the pennant center. And, uh, you know, temperature may have been a factor there as well. But uh, it's it's fun to kind of uh, think about and, and tease out. But, you know, for me, it's like it's good information to know. I know that, like, ideally, I probably want to be getting that 40 grams that's been been shown to work for me in the past uh, versus trying to go lower than that on, on races where I'm really targeting peak performance. So, um, that's the other kind of interesting thing I noticed throughout the course of the day. The, the third thing I want to talk a little bit about too, is just like the uniqueness of the psychological state on the treadmill versus somewhere else, whether that be a trail, a road, a track, anywhere where you're moving and changing environment, even in a slight amount is it feels like it points that you just have this like gnawing at your mind of like, okay, I just need to get off this machine. And my kind of, my thought going in was like, or my question, I guess, going in was how short of a break would you need to kind of break that up and kind of reset? So like, is that something where like, if I got to a point where it was just like incomprehensible for me to want to stay on the machine, would I have to step off for 10 minutes in order to reset? Would I have to step off for 30 seconds in order to reset? Like, where is that kind of window of like, okay, now I'm ready to refocus again. And for the most part, I felt like every time I would switch the treadmill or step off to use the bathroom, even if it was just like a couple, a few seconds, as simple as like stepping over the other treadmill, waiting a few seconds for it to start up and get, get going again, that really did help. It kind of almost met, made me feel like, okay, I'm starting a new run. I got a, a reset on my, my focus. Uh, the one that stood out the most to me though, was at mile 87, I, I was looking at the screen. I remember thinking like, I just cannot envision being on this thing for another 13 miles. And I, I, I convinced myself like, okay, I just need to step off and sit down for two minutes and just kind of like refocus and then get back on and then just like take care of this last half marathon. So I took that chance, I guess, and I went and I sat down 
Uh, I actually ate my only solid food of the day, which was a, a baggie, a, like a small sandwich baggie of potato chips, and then hopped back on. And as soon as I got back on that machine after that like two-ish minute break, uh, I felt great. Like I felt like, okay, I'm ready to do this. I can do 13 more miles. This isn't bad. I've done plenty of 13 mile runs on a treadmill. Uh, let's, let's get this done. And it was just like night and day difference between that, like starting that 13 miles after the break versus when I first stepped off it. So I think it's just super interesting to think of like just the way your mind works when you put yourself in an environment like this and maybe how that compares to like more normal standard ultra marathon distances. And I would be curious if that would be something that I could improve on or push through better if I would do more of this. Uh, you know, I'm one thing I'm mindful of is this is the first time I've done anything like this. It's the first time I had ran over 30 miles on a treadmill. Whereas with like my race at the Pettit center last August, you know, I'd done, I think five or six track ultras at that point. So I really had a good idea of what to expect and kind of when things would come up and how I would feel at certain stages. So it was a uh, kind of, it, it's interesting to me. I would, I would be curious if I would like, you know, invest the next few years to do a couple of these a year if I would start to get better at maybe not needing to step off the treadmill and do a mental reset or anything like that or if that's just the reality of the machine or if that's just something individual to me that is a weakness whereas if someone else could just get on there and set a certain pace and cruise and be totally fine uh you know other things too like if I'd spend more time on the treadmill would I normalize that a little better these are all just kind of I think the interesting things about the sport where we never really have a specific direct yes or no but there's a lot of kind of curiosity and wonderment that you can put into it. Uh, the other thing I want to share about that was a little different to this versus some of the other events was at the Pettit Center in a lot of my races, I try to be fairly consistent in my pacing. You know, I'm not like going like faster, slower, faster, slower within the context of a mile. Whereas with the treadmill, I felt like that really was an advantage point in terms of breaking the day up. So kind of in the early stages, it was maybe a little longer windows where I'd say, okay, I'm going to go a mile or two at this pace. But then when I hit this, I'm going to switch the pace. So I was kind of like fluctuating below and above my goal pace all day with little benchmarks to get to. So I never felt like I was doing any one thing for too long. And then as I started getting into the end stages of the, the event, it, it even tightened up to be where I was doing it multiple times during a single mile. So it'd be like, okay, for the first quarter of this mile, I'm going to run eight miles per hour. Then I'm going to turn it up to 8.2. And then at like 0.4, I'm going to turn it up to 8.4. And then at 0.6, I'm going to turn it up to 8.6. And it's just kind of like doing this, like this, like a uh, little ladder essentially where I'd go up the ladder and then come back down, up the ladder and then come back down. And that really helped kind of break up the, the different segments of a, about like I could usually do that for maybe like five or six miles before that would start to get kind of boring. And I'd try to like switch it up or change it a little bit so that it felt different. Uh, and I felt like that was the move. I think that was a much better approach than saying like, okay, I want to average X miles per hour all day. So I'm just going to set the treadmill to that and, and cruise. Um, so I thought that was kind of an interesting I insight as well or approach. Um, the other thing, fueling in general, I went through, I think it ended up being about 12 packets of S fuels race plus uh, S fuels is a company that kind of has developed a line of products for high fat, low carb endurance athletes. Um, but they've done it on a lot of the research and insight of Dr. Dan Plews, who follows a similar approach to me where we keep our carbs low, very low relative to most endurance athletes, but we don't demonize carbs to the extent that we feel like they have some, there's some usage in them from a performance standpoint but if you get fat adapted enough for these longer endurance events, you want to use them as a tool versus something that's like the foundation of your diet. So one of their products that they have is their, their race plus, which is their carbohydrate based source of, uh, of fuel, which I use on race day and like big workouts and things like that uh, so far in, in 2020. And so I had about 12 packets of that. I had that baggie of potato chips. I mentioned I had about eight ounces of soda and, um, I had a seven packets of Unicity's Unamate Yerba Mate tea, which is basically just a powder. They come in these little packets and uh, they've got about, I think about a hundred milligrams of caffeine in them. So usually when I'm doing a race like this, I'll stay away from caffeine for about the first five hours or so. And then I'll start doing like one of those packets every hour after that. 
So starting at hour five, I started putting one of those packets in my water bottle every hour and ended up doing about seven of those total then. Um, other than that, a lot of the data I, data I got was collected off of uh, my Coros Vertex watch, which I had connected to the Coros pod, which clips onto the back of your shorts on the waistband. And it, it gives you things like uh, foot strike variance from right to left, uh, stride height, stride length, cadence, all these kind of cool metrics that you can look at and see how they change throughout the course of the day. So that's kind of how I gathered a lot of the heart rate data, a lot of the cadence data, the foot strike data and all that stuff. Um, I went with the Ultra Torin uh, shoes. Usually I race in something a little more low profile, uh, but since I was a little uncertain about how my body was going to respond going 70 miles further than I ever have on a treadmill, I went a little more conservative with a little more cushion in there because my thought was that if there was going to be any stressors that were different, it was probably going to be in the lower legs versus the upper legs. Um, so I just went a little more conservative there versus a little lower profile shoe that I would normally race in. Uh, I wore a purpose shirt and shorts, which is a, they've been a fairly popular brand within like the, the triathlon community. And they're starting to work with me to help develop a running, running set of clothing and stuff. So stay tuned for kind of some of their stuff coming out down the road. Uh, we're a buff headband and dry max hyper thin socks. That was kind of the, the gear of choice on the day uh for for this particular event um yeah i think that's about it it was an exciting event i was really honored to have some of those great guests and hosts come on the show so if you're interested in seeing who that list is and like want to listen to their stuff definitely go check out the video and if you want if you can be a little patient and want to wait for me to break them up you can you can go that route as well uh if you have any questions about this that i didn't touch on or any questions in general feel free to head over to my website at zachbitter.com you can submit a form there if you have any questions or hit me up on social media instagram is at zachbitter twitter at zbitter and facebook is at zach.bitter